all I'd ask is that when people ask the question, it's a question, not a three hour legal argument. <laughs> we actually ask the question to our special guest. I guess that Linda here will be in the crowd with the mic. So just put your hand up. Yes, thanks, thanks, Alexa. That was such a graphic description, especially of, of Manning in the courtroom. I mean, I've never quite heard it like that or felt it so much. Now, this could be a very silly question, and I could even turn off the camera. I don't think you're going to answer it, but of course, the question is actually opening. Any <laughs> well, the question is, who recorded Manning's voice? I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, you know, we have our suspicions. I was going to say, was it Dan? Was it Dan? I don't actually know, and if I knew, I would never, ever say it. Of course, of course. But the interesting thing was that after that happened, things got really quite tight and got quite heavy. And I remember reading at one stage, somebody said that there was, you know, there was a gun behind your, your head. Um, and of course, all of these things that were happening were coming out on Twitter almost in, in real time. And I mean, I, I sort of see that as a real-time extension of WikiLeaks. This is kind of the way the world has become. Don't do anything bad or we're all going to know about it all the time and you always have the world looking at you and, and judging you. Do you think that this makes a difference? Certainly it made a difference to us to hear Manning's voice and that's what we really needed. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, I, I think that hearing Manning's voice was very, very important. And I think even just having his own, her own words, because everybody's been speaking for Manning, from journalists like myself to, uh, you know, his his adv her advocate, sorry, her advocate, um, to actually have her speak and explain uh, in her own words the reasons why she did it. Uh, was really, first of all, important for and fair for, for Manning, mm -hmm. but also for the public to get some insight into the humanity of this character mm -hmm. that they've heard about. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's really important. And the second part, the, the eyes of, you know, the but, whole world is watching type of thing? I mean, no doubt the internet, like any tool, can be used for good or ill. <coughs> I certainly know that, um, and I used Twitter uh, any time. I was always very respectful within the environment, but I was, I never censored myself on my Twitter. Yeah. And if I found that somebody was being blocked, I let them know. And you know what? It had, an, had a positive impact because like WBAI was a radio station in New York. They didn't let them in even though we had 60 seats available. And I tweeted out and then within an hour they got in. So it had a political impact mm -hmm. and, um, and, and they were aware of it, you know, that they mm -hmm. hated it a bit mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, we could really make a stink. Uh, when things weren't being done. Yeah, over here. Uh, Manny is the whistleblower we had to have, and uh, he certainly uh, changed the status of things uh, before Manny and after Manny. Now, most of the information that Manny has put out is basically gossip. It's might be embarrassing with the government, but it's not real serious, as Andy said. It's a lot of it's yesterday's news, but um, what are the chances of other whistleblowers coming forward higher up the food chain who've got some real information to um, show the world and the public about what is really going on in the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and all the other shen shenanigans going on behind the scenes? Well, I disagree with your characterization of Manning's leaks, firstly. You know, it's funny, I, I was in London a couple weeks ago and I sat down with Andy Worthington, who was the media partner of uh, WikiLeaks for the Guantanamo Files, and he's actually a personal hero of mine, um, because he's the authoritative historian of Guantanamo Bay. Um, and I think in many cases my journalism sort of takes off after him, he's like kind of the person that I looked to, who do I want to be like? And he talked to me about, he wanted to understand the defense arguments about the, the Guantanamo files, uh, because, you know, defense was saying that they're sourced from public information, they're not, close, they're not closely held, these were all elements with the espionage charges. 
And he said, you know, because I want to, um, I want to, uh, he's currently doing a project that needs funding, by the way, uh, <coughs> of an authoritative analysis of how bad the intelligence was um, that sourced into those detainee assessment briefs and how important that leak was to really understanding the history of the men at Guantanamo Bay. You might not think that being jailed indefinitely at Guantanamo Bay is important news, but it certainly is important to the liberty of the individual who's in that cage. And, no, or, or take, for example, like the State Department cables. If you're a Nigerian and you have confirmation that your government is being, uh, is completely infiltrated with Exxon, you might have known that, but to have it in an official document is very fucking important. Okay. Um, <laughs> to have some kind of sense of, uh, of you know, when you're like in a, a really, if you're amongst a lot of crazy people and you're the same one, you might feel like you're crazy. Well, I think that's also the experience of a lot of people who live in, um, in, in, in places that are war-torn or, or have tremendous uh, lack of stability and you see all this kind of misery around you and you're wondering, is there any sanity in the world or, or is there any hope? Or, um, and I think that uh, I could go through each of the leaks and tell you uh, important information that came out of it. So. In terms of like, you know, Snowden, Snowden's leaks are very important and they're different leaks and they're similar, uh, but Manning's leaks were watershed. Uh, Manning's leaks will be uh, for many, many years to come and probably greater as time and the propaganda around this trial lessens and people can have reason return to their heads will be uh, the game changer for this generation, no doubt. What are the chances of other going forward? Well, I think, you know, the U.S. government's policy is going to work en masse, and since everybody's terrified, but I think that those uh, brave souls, like we've discussed, they'll be, it will embolden others, I think, who will not stand to be other people's slaves, and will realize that perhaps they are, um, they too will uh, uh, contribute uh, through self-sacrifice to the betterment of all of us. Hi, Alex. Thanks. Hey. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times how important the war on terror no, and the 9-11 um, events were. Can you tell us what your opinion is on 9-11? What's behind it? Who knew about it? Um, is it really what we're told it is? And, um, yeah, have you seen the, the documentary Loose Change? And how, you haven't seen that? No. Um, no. And we get some of this here. Camp Fever, have you seen that one? No, I haven't. Anyway, well, I have, and I'd like to know what you really think is behind 9-11? Is there more to it than what we're told? You know, I don't know the answer to that question, if I'm going to be rigorously honest here. I don't know. Um, I know what the effect of 9-11 is. Yeah. I know that, um, you know, I also live in New York City, so I was in New York when it happened. I know the um, sort of the sort of most the ordinary sort of sensibility. I mean, I even know even in the run up to the Iraq War, my own internal environment, you know, in the face of that of of, of 9/11, because I lost actually childhood friends because I come from a working class neighborhood, and so most of the kids that I went to school with worked, you know, upward social mobility. They went into finance. That's how they that was their ticket out. So they died at Kenner Fitzgerald um, or things like that. So. Um, I actually have a very close friend of mine I did speech and debate with. I saw him a couple days after 9-11 and all of his male relatives were firemen. And um, I saw him down in the West Village and I remember passing by him and he was on his way to our school because our school had a memorial service. And I said, how are you? And he just completely lost it. He lost every single one of his male relatives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that we've been in a trance for 10 years in the United States. And I have great fears for the United States. And for me, I feel like the stakes are so high, like you know what we talked about earlier, that it's really imperative that 
um, the people who are awake, uh, they not waste themselves with the minutia of, and just get to work. <coughs> if you feel like something's not being reported, then it's your responsibility to do it. Those kinds of things. Um, those kinds of small actions build. And maybe that sounds like uh, a futile attempt, but it seems to have worked for me, so I'm not gonna, you know, knock it. Uh, I picked up a copy of Murdoch yesterday for the series that came about for its uh, on railway stations tonight. News I did it, the British court had decided that Assange is under no obligation to go back to sleep to answer the questions. Therefore, uh, what's the big outcome of that? If that's true. Have you heard about it? Can you ask that again? I understand. Well, I can. a report in this paper, which is a murder paper, which is handed out free on railway stations tonight, mm -hmm. said that the British court had decided that Assange is under an no obligation to go to Sweden to answer questions. So, what's one of the possibilities? Well, it's well, he seems to, he, he's raised his hand, so I'm going to A couple of days ago, uh, Independent Australia published information that the uh, European uh, extradition law will be changed. Uh, the process started in 2010 and uh, was led by British uh, legislators. And this change uh, is going to be that no any more uh, European arrest warrant can be issued against person without formal charges. And expectations are that between January and June, this will be accepted by European Union. And probably what gentleman is saying is related to this information. And now there is the issue which we know is very hot in the States now, who is journalist. There is now debate, uh, people trying to establish who uh, could be protected by, by law to yeah. protect uh, journalists and so on and so on. And uh, you know probably more about this and this of course these two things are connected because they probably preparing uh, legal grounds how to charge Assange uh, in case if this uh, extradition law will be amended in Europe. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two things in there. The U.S. right now, uh, we have to understand something. Like, If you look at the way the Obama administration has recently published their strategy document on IP theft, they, where they, they cite WikiLeaks, uh, you know, they talk about intellectual property theft and, and corporate espionage. Um, there is no question uh, in my mind, I mean, just analyzing the public record and being, you know, briefed on the, the, the Manning prosecution, that uh, if, if I were to wager how the U.S. government would charge Assange, it would be with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, because it would get around a political exception. With regards to the, the Media Shield Law, there is an Assange Clause. This was just coming out of the Senate Judiciary, so it's going into the Senate uh, General. Uh, the Media Shield Law pertains to whether or not the Justice Department would, could compel uh, a journalist to give up their sources in terrorism-related cases um, or quote-unquote national security cases. Uh, and and uh, what they did is that they, they hammered out like an agreement about what a journalist was that would get this protection. And the Assange Clause would say that an organization like WikiLeaks that prints primary source documents wouldn't be considered a journalistic organization. That you have to be an, you have to be either uh, an employee of a media organization for one year in the last twenty or three months in the last five. Um, which you know have to paycheck, or you have to have a substantial history of printing fact-based news. You know, this is where the First Amendment comes in. I mean, fundamentally, there's actually case law that there is no reporter's privilege; that the press doesn't have a greater right to freedom to, to publish um, than your average citizen. And we have to also think. I mean, in, in 1783, when the Bill of Rights was passed in the United States, you know, the First Amendment. The, 
the, you know, no law abridging the freedom of speech or that of the press. The press was a mechanism to publish. It wasn't a class of people who live on Park Avenue and go downtown to the New York Times. And that's not the, 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 the press was. It was a mechanism to publish. So there's a lot of issues with this. Most certainly the ambiguity around First Amendment issues is always a problem because First Amendment is about expression. So if you were, for example, being threatened with the possibility of being prosecuted by the Department of Justice for publishing something, um, you know, or for associating with someone, that, that chills your speech. It chills your expression. So the ambiguity around this like, idea of who's a journalist and who isn't a journalist um, is a, a chilling factor to the First Amendment, firstly. And secondly, I look at it really as a standards war by old media who needs to catch up. And so what they want to do is slow down the new market entrant because the digital has like basically destroyed the barriers to the market. It's very cheap to publish now um, and to create content. So they want to like get everyone in prison so they have like a good 10 years so they can catch up uh, and they don't have to invest in like their new, like, new model. I and mean, that's, what's, that's what's going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I recently read an article that I was going to through Facebook about, uh, and it was on the, uh, some Cleveland, uh, in America, in the US, a uh, Cleveland newspaper article about uh, what's going on in Syria. And uh, it sort of struck me uh, about something that I've recently heard about uh, how it's been proven here in this country with the, that, like, the huge media monopoly that we have in this country where in, in all the capital cities of, of Australia, there's only two capital cities that actually have more than one daily newspaper. And that you guys don't have that in the US. That's, you, you have a completely different sort of media structure. We have this insane monopoly going on in this country. Can you, can you see, or, or is there any way, any way clear for Australia to get out from underneath? that this mediocrity, this media monopoly that we have in this country, that you can... The problem with media, I mean, media firms grow naturally, <clears throat> horizontally and vertically, because they have to control audiences. All the cost is up front, it costs relatively little to distribute, so you find them, you know, becoming these media conglomerates for that very reason. And then, of course, they can exploit their economies of scale, they create, you know, some cheap content over here, they can do it over there, do it over there. So, I think the internet, of course, is like the great game changer in a lot of ways. It doesn't mean that the, you know, it's funny, we talk about civic society, especially for, I'll talk about my own country. Uh, we're a very heterogeneous society. Lots of different regions, different nationalities, races, religions, which is like reading graphic fractionalism. And the fracturing of the media, that television, for example, that, that one unified voice of like, God bless America, you know, like that thing. Uh, this is our civic society. Actually, is dangerous to some degree for a democracy because it can increase the factionalism and the sort of niche, like, I only read stuff about WikiLeaks, and I'm going to only follow people who support WikiLeaks. I mean, it could be anything, or I like baseball, or I don't like the news, so I'm not going to be informed at all. Um, so, I think that there's always a question of who owns that broad voice that gets that mainstream audience, and it's going to be the Universals and the Rupert Murdochs and the like. I think what's important is to recreate really relevant um, niche markets of, of information, um, and to make sure that that uh, to create ecosystems that will cover, for example, you know, the kind of news that uh, that Anthony covers, or to um, support leak organizations that can actually create uh, an environment for subject matter experts to in communities so that when there are issues that the, 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 the ponds are well stocked and then when those larger more universal or, or uh, uh, sort of broader stories are, are that the market is needed for that you've already have like uh, so you can fish out of that and, and create a much more informed debate. I was kind of also trying to get it. Um, like as our as our recent election proved, the, the power of the media is in this country is, is absolutely insane. Um, 
is that is there a way for us to get from where we are in this media monopoly to sort of where the US is with its because it's not it's not quite the US like is that. a mess. <laughs> yeah, but we've only got three companies really that owns nearly everything. You know, they own TV stations. You're not allowed to own three platforms, but we do have people who own two, both the print and television. You know. well, so you know, the, I, it's very concentrated. Our, our case is really extreme. It's really super concentrated. Is it? I have a question that might relate to some of this. Is the mic somewhere? Where's the? Um, oh, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I can hear you. It's fine. So yeah. I don't mind like, um, speaking up. Yeah, but please look. I think you touched on a really, really interesting point tonight about. Whether or not, I mean, there's an implication here that if we only reform the media and make it more plural, plural, pluralistic, more democratic, that that will somehow disseminate progressive information and the population will, will perhaps come around and wake up. But is it not possible that we've created such a conservative society in the West, largely because of material well-being, that there's almost a passive acceptance maybe at a subconscious level, that the mainstream actually like that sort of media and the stuff they serve up because it suits that psychological satiation, if you like, so that it's convenient for justification for injustice such as, um, such as Bradley Manning, such as global financial crisis, such as people dying every day of hunger and starvation, that there's actually, <coughs> it actually serves the modern day psyche for the media to be like that. So they are, the media is actually a creation of the population. I think it's a great question. I, I actually, you know, and then we can also, I just want to add a layer, layer of complexity because I'm going to answer it honestly. Um, I also think about the fact that, you know, philosophy is dangerous too. Uh, if you look at just like ancient Greek philosophy, like for example, take Socrates. I mean, like, you know, you have a really brilliant person and then his pupils become complete tyrants. You know, so, you know, or like Kung Fu, if I teach you how to kill somebody and you're not of the virtue to know how to control that, how do I know that I'm not teaching you how to kill <coughs> You know, so there's, there's, there's all these issues that come up with real education. And, and to be quite honest with you, I also get a little personally, politically, when everybody starts talking about the good society, I'm thinking to myself like, uh-oh, like, I, I'm very like uh, a care careful about and I become a bit hesitant. I don't even want people to die under my flag, you know, so to speak. Um, so it's a really, it's, I think it's an important question though because, you know, it also comes back to the idea of citizenship or, I mean, and of course there are people who are citizens and not citizens, but citizenship as a public office that we, you know, um, we're educated by the media. So we need the media in order to uh, have the kind of political reform. I mean, if if all we're hearing about is um, pro-war in Syria and the, the children um, that Assad killed and not hearing about the children that our president killed, um, it's very easy to manipulate people. Um, at the same time though, if citizens are constantly blaming the politicians but they're not doing anything to solve the problem, uh, they're, I'll even take it even somewhere here, like last night, I was thinking about Manning and Assange. You know, we see these leaders because they are leaders, um, thought leaders or moral leaders. And the minute they make an error or they show that they're human, uh, we all become very disappointed. And we're like, <laughs> you know, our dad is just, he's, he's got some problems. And, he's not <coughs> and everything's over, and I'm going to die now because. I don't know the way forward. I think that there's also a certain sense of self-responsibility that's also important. Like we're in very difficult times right now and we have to also say, maybe I need to actually carry the load. Maybe Manning shouldn't carry the load on his own or her own. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't turn Manning into an object um, or an idol. And I should actually say, what can I learn from Manning that can help me to be a more effective citizen um, and you know, sometimes like, I, 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 it's not that I haven't thought out a lot of the sort of philosophical implications, it's just in the practical realm of being a human being and engaging in these things, I try to keep it really freaking simple. 
which is what is the next right thing for me to do in my life with my responsibilities and my budget because I feel like that's a much more effective way at this point to actually really get something done. Um, and that's, I, I hope I answered your question. I'm gonna annoy the crap out of you. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I feel that I'm blaming my children now because uh, as I get older, I get increasingly darkly pessimistic. Uh, however, I want to relate to, to the court case, and just prior to the court case, another whistleblower emerged on the scene, and Edward Snowden. And you would have been in the, in the case progressing when all of this Edward Snowden thing was happening. How did that affect, if anything, what was going on in the court? In terms of the, the, the drama and the, the content of the trial, Snowden came up um, in a closed session. Um, it was a closed session, so we don't know exactly what was said uh, verbatim. But the next day, the judge brought up Snowden's name. And in the colloquy between defense, the government, and the court, it was clear that uh, a Department of State witness had spoken about Snowden as the sort of example of how a uh, relationship with a country, we don't know the country, uh, was damaged as a result of Manning, and then Manning's leaks led to Snowden, Snowden's leaks, or Snowden, like, re-put more salt in the wound. Um, and that this was being used as aggravation evidence against Manning uh, for the sentence. So that's how it played out in the, you know, the verbatim from the trial court record. Now, I talked to Colonel Morris Davis, who is the former chief prosecutor at Guantanamo Bay, who was a defense witness, who testified about the Guantanamo files not being closely held, um, being based on public reporting, being like not even intelligence, because um, it all pertained to the espionage charge criminal elements. And he said that he would be really surprised if Snowden wasn't on the mind of the judge. Um, Coombs said to me in the interview after the trial that uh, he also would expect that you know, the judge can't completely insulate herself from. The question is, is uh, I think that we saw that there was a, with the sentence that she gave, that the, 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 the punishment meted out to, to Manning was to um, ensure that uh, Snowden and any other person around who has the thought of being a whistleblower will realize that they're gonna get treated just like Manning was treated and that they better watch out. Okay. Um, my question relates to uh, the, when you were answering the previous question, I think that you came to a very interesting point at the end with the uh, feel of, you know, uh, what what do I do at the end when I know all these things and, and obviously the stakes are high that we're talking about and the world is becoming more and more interesting with the internet bringing us all the information and of course um, uh, the powers that be try to stamp on individuals who try to do brave things, present company included, uh, and nobody talks about the corporations that do uh, terrible evil. It's almost expected that a corporation would be doing selfish things because that, that they'd be big monsters that act, you know, without a consciousness. So when things leak out and when we find out about uh, what's happening, um, what, uh, I mean, individually, we, we, very small and, and it gets frustrating, you know, what, what do I do? All I do is get upset and can't sleep. Um, so you've been involved or you know about the Occupy movement, all that stuff. Uh, it seems that this needs to be some kind of a mass sort of collective action that we can take to, to, to get things moving somehow so that we are satisfied and not just upset. Uh, so when we find out about these leaks and about this, what's going on, what Kelly was next on and, um, uh, you know, and, and Monsanto are doing, uh, what, what in your view is, is the action that we should take so we, we don't just get frustrated? Well, I think there's a carrot and a stick. I mean, I think the, I fundamentally, uh, nonviolence is very important. And the reason why I say that is, is at a practical level as well as an ethical level, 
it's very important because it, it, you know, it's very easy to tear things apart. It's very hard to put them back together. Um, it's very hard to find, and I think that if you're going to really win this battle, like I, I think it's a little ridiculous. Like even in the run up to Occupy, like they were like, we gotta, we're gonna keep our logistical plans secret. I mean, the New York City Police is the largest paramilitary force in the world. They have helicopters that can see lit cigarettes from like 10 miles away, and they have vans that drive by and see through six feet of concrete. There's nothing that's going to be secret. So when strategizing around that kind of military state, I think it's really important to, um, to be realistic. Um, and I think also Chris Hedges makes a great point about the fact that, like in, in, in Egypt as well, it's like you, you really want the police to actually, eventually, you want to be able to lobby them by your behavior so that they're uh, you know, called to conscience. And, um, and I think that that, that, can, that can be done. So nonviolence is very important. But I also think that you know, coming out of the labor movement, uh, and this, my, you know, my dad is a retired Teamster delegate, my grandfather unionized Boeing. I mean, there is also the reality that, you know, when people realize that, that there are consequences to mistreating other people, um, and that could be different for different scenarios, I think that's also a motivator too. And I, I, I think that it, um, sometimes that is just simply, uh, it can be economic. Uh, it can be also um, just, you know, if, if that people are going to lose their reputations. I mean, there is also the negative aspect of that as well. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't exist. Um, so I think that fundamentally, it's hard to answer these questions in the abstract. I mean, it has to be a particular action for something, finding people that you trust with affinity, staying focused, and also <coughs> building out the traditions too. I think it's important for activist groups to remain, in some cases, poor. I think that there should be a sense of like common purpose um, but then also, I think in certain other activist circles, it's important to have autonomy. Like for me, I like to be able to do what I want to do because I, I like to work hard and I don't like, like, for the Manning trial, it would have been great to bring on a bunch of volunteers, but I had so much work to do and I was so afraid of having some kind of meltdown happen where there's like a bunch of people who are like having like a, you know, a bitch fest and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like and I was so petrified. Yeah, I was I was petrified of falling behind in the trial. So I was like, I'm going to do this on my own. It's it'll get done, you know. So it just depends on the scenario. Mm -hmm. That's a question. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is: Is anyone covering the legal profession really? Because a lot of, I, we don't seem to see the rule of law anymore. Yeah. It, corporations have more rights than human beings. Governments were created by human beings and more rights than human beings. I don't think you are a human being. You are a third class citizen, unless you are controlling, owning, and managing an institution or government. It's it's you're right. I mean, corporations have more human rights than the detainees at Guantanamo Bay. Is anyone covering the legal profession? I think it's a big problem, but. I think it's a great it's a, it's it's great because also you have these like really crappy blogs that are like passing off as like legal experts talking about national security issues and you're like you know who are these bozos like the, the guy just like rolled out of bed and like you know he, he's sort of parroting off what he heard somewhere else um, one of the things I'll say about the Manning trial it's not just the press that didn't show up DC is the center of like three major law schools in the US there were no lawyers there no young we had one woman who was a law student who showed up, and the like the three you know stalwarts were like, well, what, where do you go to school, and what are you interested in? And we were like, and she actually went to school with people who were interning at the State Department, and it was interesting to talk to her. She said she, that WikiLeaks came up in one of her classes, and that everybody in the classroom absolutely felt that Manning should go away for life, and so the political climate, even in the law schools, the advocacy schools is also really dangerous, um, dangerously uh, cynical uh, within the U.S. Just one more question. One more question. Uh, yes. And I would agree, as an American, I would have to say, first of all, you're a patriot. Thank you for being here. It's difficult to be American sometimes in this country. Um, and I am an economic and political refugee here, I feel. Um, but what I wanted to make a comment on is Nick Elford, also one of my heroes, and watching that unfold when I was a young child, I remember my parents making sure that we learned a lesson about that. 
What I find nowadays, though, in terms of talking about these current cases, is that it's not being taught the way that it should be taught in terms of the constitutionality of it. And as a lawyer myself, I was quite disturbed by that, that it wasn't even brought up the fact that the, the trial was, was a farce, basically. Um, but the question I have specifically is about Snowden, because we now have also a country involved, Russia, which is quite unusual considering Wikileaks is not a country, man is not a country. How do you think that's going to play out in the geopolitical scene? You know, I'm not, I, I, I'm not even going to pretend to be able to answer that. I don't know, to tell you the truth. I think that fundamentally Snowden is um, safer today, and maybe Assange isn't as safe as a result of, of what Assange and WikiLeaks did for Snowden. But I think that also shows you on some level the character of Assange, deep, deep down. Um, I think that, you know, unfortunately, uh, Pawns. I mean, everybody's a pawn in this political, this geopolitical game. So I, I don't think Snowden is like home free, scot free, safe at all. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, ten feet in, ahead, and then I can see ten feet ahead, and then ten feet ahead. Right now, he's safer than he was two months ago. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to. Um, Ask you all to thank Alexa again. I just wanted to say two quick things to finish. Um, I've got, I've got a lot of indeed, well, before we yes, two quick things. One, um, you can all, uh, if you're on Twitter, I would suggest you follow Alexa. If you're not, then join Twitter, especially for it, follow one person, her, or me, maybe two. Um, well, many people actually, but I'd also suggest you go to her website, alexaoryan.com, and you can also subscribe and support her work there financially and other ways too. Because independent journalism, sadly, is not free. Should be, but it's not. Um, and thank you very much for coming to Australia and doing these events. I think we often get a sense of some of these questions I think reflected tonight that our media in Australia, those who understand that we just had an election, as you know, a few weeks ago, and the decision was, uh, well, the Medal of Press got their name, put it that way. It's more complicated than that, but they certainly did. And they're going to expect a bit of payoff. That's the way it's going to work in the next years. Um, independent voices have never been more important, so thank you for being here. Thank you for being here.